a monster. It's my world. A madman. I run with a pack of wolves, and I've got to be a wolf. A mastermind of one of the most horrific killing sprees in U.S. history. What do you think's gonna happen when I get out? The savagery that, that went on that night, it is uncomprehensible. Charles Manson transformed a group of young women into vicious killers. He was the dictatorial ruler of the family, the king, the Maharaja. A man who redefined evil and violently ended seven innocent lives. Charles Manson is literally one of the worst human beings that ever walked this planet. He just seemed on fire. I'm terrible. I'm a terrible guy, man. August 9th, 1969. The secluded home of a jet set celebrity couple, director Roman Polanski and actress Sharon Tate. Sometime after midnight, intruders cut the telephone lines to the house, killed one man in the driveway, then ambushed the four people inside. Tate begged for the life of her unborn baby. Just let me have my baby, and then you can kill me any way you want. Just let me have my baby. They didn't. Tate was stabbed 16 times, three times to the heart. They hanged her before they killed her. The others were butchered too. 86 stab wounds in total. The word pig was written in blood on the door. The victims were soaking in it. Officers who attended the murder scene had not seen anything like it, and we're talking about Los Angeles PD veterans. But they would see something just as shocking the following night. The bodies of a man and his wife found in their home. No one on the outside knew just how bad it was on the inside. And their bodies had been mutilated. They'd been stabbed repeatedly. A fork was left in Lino abdomen. Someone had carved a word on his stomach. There were words written in blood on the walls and on the refrigerator. Strange words, death to pigs. It sent this wave of panic through Los Angeles and through the Hollywood community. If they could get to a movie star, if they could get to a coffee artist, then they could get to anybody. They lived here on this abandoned movie set where a charismatic, self-styled guru named Charles Manson led a group of impressionable young followers. You know, they worship Charlie like a god. Friday night in Los Angeles, a movie actress and four of her friends were murdered. And the circumstances were lurid. The grief-stricken families knew nothing about the strange group living miles away in the desert. Nothing about their leader, Charles Manson, who had grown increasingly menacing. The free-living, free-loving life on Spawn Ranch had turned dangerous. When Charlie was arrested in Death Valley, he was booked as Charles Manson, a.k.a. Jesus Christ, because he was telling everyone he was the reincarnation of Jesus. Well, God, I guess you're my best friend, being I invented you. Deputies searched a rundown chicken ranch outside of Lancaster Lake today. They were investigating suspicious diggings around the ranch where five missing children of a Manson family member were found yesterday. The children were discovered hiding in a five by three foot covered dirt hole in a chicken coop at the back of the ranch. They were unharmed. The ranch has been identified as a hangout for members of the Manson family. Sergeant, what have you found here? Well, we came up here uh, because of the uh, children that were found yesterday being uh, part of the Manson family and me knowing or because I've known them in the past years. Uh, we uh, found four children in a small hole here covered over with a piece of uh, plywood and then one baby in a, in a larger hole. Uh, we did have a runaway located, a 14-year-old runaway that was located inside the house. Just how does this connect with the Manson family, Sergeant? The uh, four children that were uh, found in the hole are the children of one of the uh, uh, Dennis Rice. You say the children were back there hidden. Do you think that the children were hiding from the officers when they came here, or do you think they were placed back there? 
Well, I don't know whether they were placed, but that's ordinarily that's what they were taught to do, to uh, hide from the police. They were taught to run to places like that. It would be possible that the older ones could have run back there, and, but the smaller ones, I would suggest that they were placed there. What, what is the uh, status now of Rice? I uh, talked with uh, an officer this morning, and uh, he tells me that the uh, Dennis Rice was released about three weeks ago, although I don't have any personal knowledge of that. He had been uh, held on a grand theft charge. I really don't know what the exact status is. Now, have the four children been returned to the mother? Not as yet. In fact, we're trying to reach the mother now. We're in the process of trying to find her. You know, I, I sought reality through my own pursuit of pleasure. I began getting involved. I, I read all the world's uh, religious scriptures. I, I uh, sought reality and truth through psychedelic drugs. Along came psychedelics, LSD, psilocybin, and mescaline. And I began to try all these drugs. And, and pretty soon, uh, I began to reap what I had sown. I began go, going to jail, getting in trouble. My involvement with the Manson family began in 1970, shortly after the murders. I was living in Hollywood, California with my four children. Uh, my wife had left me for a lifestyle of drugs and alcohol, and I'd see her every now and then staggering down Hollywood Boulevard with one foot in the gutter and her lipstick over here. Months went by. There were no clues, no leads, no nothing. The city of Los Angeles was frozen in fear. But ultimately, as it always happens, someone talked. Someone in jail for a minor offense began to brag to their cellmate about their involvement in the headlines that were dominating the world's press. So guess what the cellmate did? They told. And then the police came on the scene and they arrested a bunch of long-haired people in the desert of California and brought them to trial in Los Angeles for the murder of Sharon Tate and the others. Charles Manson and his family were in the Los Angeles County Jail. While they were there, Rolling Stone magazine came and did an interview with Charlie. I read that interview. And I couldn't believe how here a man who's accused of all these heinous, horrible crimes had a sense of humor and was you know, like cracking jokes. And I was going, man, what kind of a guy is this? It's a trip. I've got to check this out. So. Remember, I told you I had four kids, right? So every Sunday afternoon, we would go out for a drive. So here we are, you know, we're out for a drive, and we're going to the Spawn Movie Ranch, where some of the family's still hanging out. So we drove up to the front of the ranch, and my kids said, hey, Dad, can we ride the horses? I said, well, if it's okay with these people here. So while I stayed behind, they went out to ride the horses. I stayed behind and began to talk to these young people. But it was incredible. I said, man, this is far out. We were invited to come back. We came back again that night. We started to come back and spend more time at the ranch. My kids loved it. It's like they had eight moms all at once. I, like I had my choice of any women that I wanted. You know, it was wonderful. You know, we were having fun. So I've got, I went to jail to visit Charlie. I talked to Charlie. He talked in parables like Jesus. I was going, wow, this guy's far out. You know, I'd carry messages back and forth from him to the family. The longer I hung around, the more I began to believe. Maybe, you know, maybe Charlie is indeed the Messiah. I didn't know. He said he was. I, you know, furthermore, the longer I hung around, the more I realized that this man hadn't killed anybody. And yet, the state of California was going to put him in the gas chamber. They were going to put him in the gas chamber. I said, well, we can't let that happen. You know? I mean, if he is a Messiah, what a, what a terrible tragedy to watch it all happen again. We got to get him out. So I joined with other family members in a plot to free Charlie from jail. Charlie had told us, don't come to get me unless you can take out the whole jail. How many know the Los Angeles County Jail has lots of inmates? Thousands of inmates. So we were going to need a lot of guns. So we held up an army surplus store in Hawthorne, California. We had 156 guns stacked out beside our van when the police arrived. We, they responded to a silent alarm triggered by a clerk. We came out the back of the store. We opened fire on the police car. We blew out the front window of their car with a shotgun. If they had been in the car, they would have been dead, and I would not be standing here right now. But they'd gotten out of their car, and they were hiding behind a wall on the other side of the alley. So as soon as we got back in our van, they opened up on us. 
They put so many holes in that van, it looked like Swiss cheese. I felt bullets creasing my scalp and passing my body. And after what seemed like an eternity of gunfire, but I'm told only lasted about seven minutes, involving the police departments of five cities, we were arrested and taken to the same jail that we planned to liberate, the Los Angeles County Jail. I spent 17 months in that jail waiting for trial. At my sentencing, I would say, whatever I did was out of love for my brothers and sisters. There is no wrong in love. I got that directly from Charlie. I was sent to San Quentin Prison, the garbage can of California, where they sent all the maniacs, all the worst people, all the killers, uh, every, all the worst people in the state. Now, why they sent me there, I just don't know. I was such a nice guy. But for some reason, they thought I was dangerous, so they sent me up there with all the other killers. Two years later, they let, they let me out, only to go right back for refusing to abide by the conditions of my parole, which was not to associate with any members of the Manson family. Well, now, they couldn't tell me who my friends were going to be. As a matter of fact, they weren't going to tell me nothing at all, because I was a rebel. Three times, in and out. Another six months, another year, another six months. But finally, on the third time back, it was different. Because God began to bring Christians into my life. I had a mother who was praying for me. I had an ex-girlfriend. Her sister had come to see me in the penitentiary. She said, you know, Kathy's become a Jesus freak. I said, no way. She would never do a thing like that. We used to party. I know this girl. But then she came to see me. And it was true. I had a cellmate. Now, I grant you, this man may have been a little crazy because all he did all day long was sit in our cell and read his Bible. Well, it just so happened that at that very time, the prison experienced a lockdown. If you don't know what that is, that means a bunch of people have just gotten killed on the prison yard, so they lock everybody up so it won't happen again. So there we were, locked in our cells, nine feet by four feet. You didn't get out to eat, they threw you two bag lunches a day in the cell. You didn't get out to shower. Uh, you, you, you just lived with yourself. You didn't get out to do your laundry. I mean, you didn't get out for nothing. Not visits, not nothing. And this particular lockdown lasted for over 100 days. And here I am, locked in a cell with a man who reads his Bible all day long. Well, I told you. We didn't get out to do our laundry, right? So one day I'm washing out my socks in the sink. And I'm scrubbing these socks and I'm scrubbing these socks and I'm scrubbing them and I'm scrubbing them until my knuckles begin to bleed. I got nothing else to do, you know. My knuckles begin to bleed. And this guy says to me, you know, no matter how hard you scrub, you'll never wash away your sins. And I said, this guy has got to go. As soon as I got out of my cell, I went down to the guard shack. I said, you better get that guy out of there before I hurt him. Well, they got me out of there. But I still wasn't safe. Because as soon as the prison opened back up again, we were back out on the yard. Other convicts were coming to me, and they were telling me, hey, Dennis, let me show you what I read in my Bible today. And I, you know, I say, oh, no, here they come again. You know? I, but there's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. I had to sit there and listen. And the longer I sat there and listened, the more I realized that my Jesus wasn't their Jesus. I said, yeah, I know Jesus, I know Charlie. But their Jesus was changing their life, and mine wasn't doing nothing for me. Man, these guys were killers. These guys were dangerous guys. These guys were the most dangerous men on the yard. And yet, they were changed on the inside. I could feel it. I wasn't afraid of them anymore. I said, well, maybe God, uh, maybe... Uh, just maybe I, I, I'm wrong. You know? So, well, I got nothing to lose, lifetime in prison or death, so I might as well just give uh, uh, this God a chance and see, if, uh, see what happens. So, all right, God, if you're real, show me. Two days went by, standing out in front of my cell, waiting to lock up. In the penitentiary, you do not open your own door. They open it for you. So I'm standing waiting for them to open my door. And I hear a man down the tier, and he's cursing, and every other word out of his mouth is a four-letter word. And I go, oh, that's terrible. But two days before that, every other word out of my mouth was a four-letter word. So what God had done, he'd done a miracle to show me he was real. 
He didn't have to do that. He's not obligated to do that. But knowing what a hard-headed, stubborn dude he was dealing with, he did that for me to show me that he was real. The door to my cell opened. I went in. I got down on my knees. I said, all right, God, I know you're real now. What do you want me to do? He said, there's the book. Read it. I said, read it? Why? I've read it. It's the only book they give you to read in jail. He said, read it again. I said, okay, you're God. So I began to read. But this time it was different. This time the words literally became alive and began to jump off the page to me. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, oh, so that's what they're talking about. Oh, yes, now I see, yes, yes. But it wasn't all good news. This book told me I was a sinner. I never believed in sin. I thought, whatever I do, I do, you know. God's not going to blame me for that, you know. I'm okay, you're okay, right? But he said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I began to feel as though I were the dirtiest, filthiest, scummiest person in the entire earth. I began to feel as though there was a green slime all over me. And I began to cry out to God. I says, God, you've got to take this feeling away from me. I can't stand it. And I got up off my knees and that feeling was gone. And I knew that in that moment of time, God had totally forgiven me for everything I'd ever done. I was clean for the first time in 38 years. And oh man, did it feel good. I began to read this book six hours a day. I couldn't get enough. It's like I'd never had anything to eat in my whole life, and here was food, like I'd never had anything to drink in my whole life, and here was water, and boy, I began to suck it up. I began to pray for my children, my ex-wife. She had divorced me while I was in prison. I began to pray for them. Went down to the chapel there in the prison. I, said, I told the men in the chapel, I've decided to follow Jesus. But the sight I saw when I walked into that chapel, I'll never forget. Because I saw a bunch of men sitting around singing a song. Now these were big men. These were mean looking men. These were ugly men. These are men you would have been afraid of because I was. But I saw them sitting around, men of different races, sitting around singing a little song. And I went, Ooh, God, you are awesome! If you could do this, you could do anything. You might even change me. I began to hang around with these men in the chapel. I began to pr pray. I began to write to a Christian lady I was writing to on the street, told me about a church. So within an hour after the gate closing behind me, I was in that church. It wasn't Sunday, but the door was open. I went in there, and I said, uh, is a pastor here? They said, yeah, he's over there on the ladder. He's painting. I said, walked in, I, said, I said, Pastor, my name is Dennis Rice. I just was released from San Quentin Prison, and I want to serve God. He said, you're in the right place. That church was a Holy Ghost-filled, Bible-preaching, devil-stomping, outreaching church just like this one. They had a juvenile hall ministry. I was a natural. I could tell those kids, I've been to the end of the road that you're on, and you don't want to go there. Because it's all about death and dying. It's all about walking a run across that prison yard until you're so sick and tired of being sick and tired that even death would be a welcome experience. I saw men laugh while other men died just to hide their own horror and fear. It wasn't bad. It wasn't cool. It wasn't macho. It was all about nothing. That ministry was fruitful. We saw a lot of kids come to Christ. So God wasn't through with me in San Francisco. He had plans for me in here in Phoenix. Phoenix was the last place on earth that I wanted to go. It was hot. It was dusty. I grew up here. I didn't like it. I didn't want to come here, but God said go. Why? Because my kids were here. Remember, I told you I had four kids. But one by one by one by one, my children all came, and they gave their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. And today they're all saved and living for God. They all testify. We knew that God was real when we saw him change our dad. When I was working in this all-night bookstore, and I was taking care of my four children by myself. My wife had left me for a lifestyle of drugs and alcohol. And I would see her every now and then. 
staggering down Hollywood Boulevard, one foot in the gutter, her lipstick over here. It was sad, but she loved those drugs. This is only the beginning. God has a purpose and a plan for you. I came out of prison with nothing but a pair of bell-bottom Levi's and a pair of Adidas tennis shoes, a prison record this long, and no job skill. It's like, God, what can you do in this mess? But he took me into juvenile hall, and I gave my testimony for 60 young men, and all 60 young men came to know Jesus as their personal Savior. And I said, God, you got a plan. you got a plan for me. And he's got a plan for you.